When we were looking at what the church is um, as defined in Scripture, it occurred to me that one of the things you have to look at is what the apostles said about the fact that they were going to die. The fact is that they had, you know, human lives that had finite upper limits, you know, and they knew this, and the time approached, and the time came, and the time went, and it's commonly thought that this was a surprise, and that people were kind of scrambling, not sure what they should do next, or how this should continue. So I thought we ought to look at the New Testament on this topic, which would be succession. How does it pass on from the apostles? And the quote is after my departure, because the apostles use this idea of they will be leaving. There's a departure coming. What happens when I'm gone is the idea. And that's the succession according to the New Testament. Well, the first thing you have to notice is that Jesus himself ended up leaving. And so he had to have something in mind for what would be done after he was gone. And he did. While he was still here on earth teaching, he appointed apostles. And apostles are a fairly precise thing. He, they're not just disciples. They're those whom he chose to send. When you ask, how was the New Testament written? You look at the letters and the Gospels, and everything that is in there from cover to cover, from Matthew to Revelation. It's coming from these sources. First, it is the Lord's chosen apostles themselves. There were 12 in number. You saw somebody replace Judas, who died. And you saw Paul come later. But he chose these, and you have the Gospel of Matthew, you have the Gospel of John, you have letters from Peter, you have letters from Paul. It's also the case that the brothers of the Lord Jesus wrote letters. One of them is James, and I have decided the letter of James is from the brother of the Lord because it comes at the same time to the same audience. That is, it's very early in the, in the time of the church before there was and understanding generally that all the nations would be included, not just the nation of Israel. And Peter clearly identifies himself as an apostle of the Lord, as all of the apostles do whenever they write. The fact that James doesn't do this is telling me that must be the Lord's brother. And Jude is the other brother of the Lord from whom we have a letter. It's right before the Revelation. And there are those who were scribes on their behalf. For Paul, Luke was the traveling companion, as is made very clear in the book of the Acts. He's the one going about with him. And Paul himself speaks of Scripture when he says the laborer is worthy of his wages. And this quotation comes from the Gospel of Luke. So this is the meaning. And Mark is thought to be the scribe for Peter who sent his gospel to the Romans. But these are the writers. They're the ones who put it together. The apostles are the ones who are in charge. The, the Lord's brothers are very similar to apostles insofar as they were with him. They knew him. They knew him well. They witnessed his resurrection. We noted earlier, and it's coming from Mark chapter 3 in the 14th verse, where Jesus appoints the 12. They're not just disciples. There were those from among his disciples, a lot of people following him at the time, but he chose 12 whom he also named apostles. Because apostle means sent. An apostle is somebody sent on behalf of another person, a delegate, a representative. He chose these that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So they're there to be with him, to to follow along and to be present when he's teaching and present at other times that are very important to see and to have eyewitnesses. And he's also sending them out. When we look at the end of Luke 24, the end of Luke in the 24th chapter there, you see 45 down, verses 45 down.
that when the Lord Jesus met some of the apostles on the road after his resurrection, he appears to them. They don't yet understand who, who they're talking to, that it's the risen Jesus who's walking with them. But at that point in time, Luke records in the 24th chapter, 45th verse, he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. It had said that he was going to send them out to preach, and now in Luke 24, after he's resurrected and appears to them and opens their minds to understand all of the scriptures, he reiterates this mission, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's verse 47. And these apostles, verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. So Jesus appointed them. Jesus inspired them. He gave them what they were to testify about. They were with him. They heard the teaching. They have seen his resurrection. They now understand the scriptures in a way that they had not understood up until this point. And he gave them a charge about what they are to do. When you're sending an apostle or when you're sending a delegate, uh, you know, an emissary, uh, an ambassador, you know, a representative, it's necessary that you give them a charge. You have to tell them what it is that they're supposed to say on your behalf. And this is also true. Jesus chose these 12, called them apostles over and above any other disciples. They are the ones who are specially given this mission, and they are to teach the nations and testify about his resurrection. We read this already in Luke 24, but if we read the rest of Luke in Acts chapter 1, you see that it continues. He's very consistent. Luke is the author of both that gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles being Paul's travel companion. <coughs> but you see there in Acts 1 that he follows on what he had told them at the end of Luke by saying in the 8th verse, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Jerusalem is this city. Judea is the region that it is in. Samaria is a neighboring region with people who have some kind of belief in God and have some lineage back to ancient Israel. But not just these, to the end of the earth. They're going to be his witnesses. They're going to testify, not just here, but everywhere. It's going to start here and it's going to emanate from here. But it's going everywhere to the end of the earth. And in the ninth verse, when he said these things to them, or had already spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. So here he ascends into heaven, leaving the apostles there with the charge of what they are to do. They're going to receive power when the Spirit has come upon them, which happens in the second chapter of the book of Acts. But look at how concrete this is and how specific it is. It's rather explicit, the instructions of Jesus. He is making them the witnesses. They're going to testify to something that they have seen in the same sense that we have witnesses today. You can't go to court and say you had this feeling. No, you have to have seen or heard something in order to be a witness. You testify to what you laid eyes on or you laid hands on or you heard with your own ears. If you didn't hear it with your own ears, with your own ears, that's called hearsay. It is not admissible evidence. You cannot witness, be a witness for that. So he's chosen these to be his witnesses. He's told them, you're going to stay here. The power is coming and it will spread. You're going to testify from here onward. And then he leaves. That means it's been entrusted to them. What's the plan for his departure? Well, that's what's going to happen. The apostles are going to spread this word. They're going to spread it how far? To the ends of the earth. So when we look at what they wrote then, the first letter from John is a good example. 
When you look at what the apostles themselves wrote, you find that they were not confused about this. There was not confusion among them about what is going to be done. Now that Jesus is gone, what do we do? There was no confusion about that. Oh, you might point to early in the Gospels, right after he had resurrected, before they'd seen him arisen. Oh, maybe so. They didn't quite understand yet. But by the time Acts 1 and Acts 2 come around and they're endued with power and they're speaking the words of God, no, there's no confusion. 1 John chapter 1 the epistle, the first letter that John wrote, begins in this way, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. That life was made manifest. We have seen and bear witness, and we declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. This is an apostolic duty. When Jesus picked them and said they had to be with him and that they were going to be his witnesses to these things, well, here are the witnesses' testimonies. They heard it, they saw it, they handled it with their own eyes, and this is the thing to which they bear witness and they declare to us. When you look at Paul's writings, he says the same thing. Ephesians chapter 3 is a good example of this where he said, I, Paul, am the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you nations, if indeed you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God given to me on your behalf, that is, the grace that God gave to me, how that by revelation he made known to me the mysteries as I have briefly written already. Some might laugh if you've ever read Paul's writings. <laughs> it's hard to think of these as brief. By which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Yes, Paul is entrusted with a stewardship, as were all the apostles. The mystery is made known to Paul by revelation. Paul writes these things to us. And we, when we read them, verse 4, may understand his knowledge in the mystery of Christ. It's no longer a mystery, you see, because the mystery has been made clear to him, and he has written it down for us to read and understand it. But that's what they're doing. He sees it that way. That stewardship was given to him by God on our behalf, to whom he is writing. And Peter sees it the same way. When you look in his second letter, he makes clear that he also is testifying to what he received, what he saw. In Second Peter, at the first chapter of that, the 16th verse, he said, We, apostles, did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is recorded in the Gospels. And Peter was there. And we heard this voice which came from heaven, and we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. The apostles have the word, the confirmation of it. We have to read it. We have to receive that testimony. We have to pay attention. They're not confused about their duty and their role in this thing. They see it very clearly that they received from the Lord directly which they, what they also delivered to us and that we are to follow those instructions. Well, here's the other thing about it. Not just do we have to read what they said and listen to what they are telling us while they're among us or when we receive those letters, but also 
they themselves knew that what they were doing was writing Scripture. They saw it that way. They understood it that way. We mentioned already how Paul quotes, uh, the laborer is worthy of his wages and calls it Scripture. That's from the Gospel of Luke, who was his travel companion. But I want to get across to you the idea that Scripture is not being decided sometime later by a council of fuddy-duddies. Scripture is something that the apostles knew they were writing. The first thing that needs to be understood in any discussion of this matter is the third chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans, where we ask what the advantage is to being Jewish. Well, there were many advantages to being part of that nation to whom God made some of the promises. But the chief advantage is that second verse, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. It was committed or entrusted to them, the oracles of God. What is this? It's what God says. The revelation, the direct utterance of his spirit being recorded, that that record, that writing, the decision is for the Jews. This is the reason why we do not accept books of the Bible that a lot of religious people do. In the Old Testament, they add a lot of things that are called deuterocanonical, in polite company, apocryphal, in more polemic circles. But those books are not part of the Bible because the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God and they never recognized those books. And it was up to them. It was not up to, you know, foreign nations in Egypt, in Rome, anywhere else. It was up to the Jews and they did not accept those books. God was with them. That's the way that is. That's settled and over. But don't forget that the apostles were also Jews, that Jesus was a Jew, and the apostles were Jews. And they also are entrusted, as we read, with a stewardship from God. And so that's why you see Peter saying, for example, in his second letter, in the closing of that, in the third chapter there, that Paul's writings are Scripture. As Peter writes his last letter, knowing that he is going to die, among the warnings that he gives is that sometimes people take Paul out of context and twist what he says. But he said to them in 2 Peter 3, it's the 15th and 16th verses, Consider the long suffering of our Lord to be salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, has written you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, true, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures. The other Scriptures, the remainder of the Scriptures. He calls Paul beloved. We know Paul to be an apostle. They knew each other. He says, our beloved brother Paul wrote to you in all his letters. And you know, some of Paul's letters, for example, Galatians chapters 1 and 2, have some very unflattering things to say about Peter's practices in the past. Peter's aware of that, but he's repentant, so he accepts that. But the writing that is important to us here is that 16th verse where he said that Paul's writings are scriptures, that people who are unstable and ignorant twist them in the same way they do the rest of the Scriptures. They thought of it as Scripture when they were writing it. They thought of one another's writings as Scriptures. When you look at Paul's epistles, as Peter said we ought to do, and called them Scripture, what is the Scripture saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, for example? Well, one of them is that the teaching of the apostles... Paul is the prime example, of course, in 1 Corinthians. He's the one who wrote that letter, but it applies to all of them. The teaching of the apostles is universal. He told the church there in the 17th verse of the 4th chapter that Timothy would remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. 
Timothy was sent by Paul to the church at Corinth. He said that he sent him to remind you of my ways in Christ. Do you notice what he did not send Timothy to do? He did not send Timothy to continue Paul's ways in Christ. He did not send Timothy to take over for Paul now that Paul is gone. He did not send Timothy to reveal to you the rest of God's message for the church. You see that? I know it's not there, but I'm trying to make it clear. When Jesus left, he said, I'm leaving, and I'm appointing you, and you're going to testify here, there, and everywhere. That's not what the apostles said. I sent Timothy to remind you of what I said, <laughs> as I teach them everywhere in every church. Now, is this egotistical on Paul's part? No. No, it's authority, because he is an apostle. He has seen the risen Jesus. It's universal. What he says, he says everywhere, in every church. It's the same truth for everybody. And that implies that the message is knowable, it's contained, it's complete. Later in this same letter, in the 16th chapter, is the instruction for how to take uh, the collection, how to take money. And the thing that's important to us to focus on at the moment is this little bit in the first verse concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. The directions that Paul gives are universal. The teachings that Paul gives, they are universal. The directions that he gives are universal. When he gives orders or directions, instructions, to the church at Galatia, or the churches in Galatia, that applies to the churches in Corinth too, and it applies to us in the same way. Of course it does. That's why he said this to Corinth, to whom he had not given that direction. When he gave it to Galatia, that meant it was bound for the churches to do it in this way. So Corinth must do it this way, and you and I must do it this way. This is universal as well. The letters are universal. When you look at Colossians, another letter from Paul. But remember, Peter told us these were Scripture. All his letters. So you're going to have to argue with Peter if you don't like going through Paul's letters. And yet I believe what he said, that he had the prophetic word more sure, to which we do well to heed. But Colossians 4, in his closing remarks, Paul said to them in the 16th verse, When this letter is read among you, see that it's read also in the church of Laodicea, the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the letter from Laodicea. When he wrote a letter to one place, it was intended to be shared with the other places. He knew he was writing these letters. He knew that they were going to be shared. When Peter calls his writings scriptures, he also knew that these letters had been sent out and that they had been shared, and that the instructions in them were universal for all the churches. And yes, Paul at the end of his life in 2 Timothy, in chapter 4, sounds this alarm Well, I say alarm. To Timothy, it must have been alarming to realize that Paul is going to die. If 2 Timothy 4, 6, I am being poured out already as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. So, what are the thoughts with him leaving? 13th verse, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books but especially the parchments. What's on the parchments? Well, parchment is animal skin. This is far more uh, long-lasting than scrolls made of papyrus. Papyrus has, you know, a useful life, but not very long. It deteriorates quickly unless it is being 
explicitly preserved in some way, you're sealed up, dry, you know. But parchment is something that lasts for centuries. It was very expensive. They used it to write down important matters, law and code. Wealthy people would use it for their, I suppose what we would call trusts, things that are going to be passed on from generation to generation. But wealthy people did because poor people couldn't afford them. They were very expensive to have a scribe and to have a parchment. It's clear what he means by this. They're already keeping the scriptures in parchments. And you're seeing the useful life of a parchment is three or four centuries. When do we see a, a flourishing? You know, if you're looking at the history of the transmission of New Testament manuscripts, when do you see a whole bunch of copies made? In the 300s AD. Why is that? Because that's about the time that the parchments from Paul's day would be wearing out, and it's time to recopy them. It makes perfect sense. His prized possession was the scriptures they were writing. It's clear. I can do without a coat in this cold jail. I can do without my records of affairs, but I need that Bible. You bring that above all else. Well, consider this. The apostles themselves did not name a successor. Here's the truth of the matter. They named no successor. They gave us to the word is what they actually did. They considered themselves to be what Jesus said they were. His emissaries, his entrusted messengers, they were given this word that we are supposed to pay attention to. It's universal for all of us. They knew they were writing it. They knew they were preserving it. In Acts 20, we can start with Paul here and just look fairly quickly at these. But Paul, when he is about to die, says something to the elders of the church at Ephesus. First, he tells them in the 25th verse of Acts 20, Indeed, now I know that you all among whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. They will never see Paul again. He's about to die. So what does he send next? What will happen after Paul is dead? It's the 32nd verse. So now, brothers, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The word is able to build you up. The word is able to give you the inheritance among the sanctified. Aren't we looking to inherit heaven? Don't we inherit the promises in Christ Jesus? Is Paul saying that the word of God is sufficient to get us to heaven? Yes, he is, very explicitly. He's going to die. They're not going to see his face ever again. So now what do they do? Now... I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able. God can do it. His word can do it. He named no successor. Not Timothy, not Clement, not anybody else. He named no successor. He said, you go to God and you go to his word. That is the thing that can give you the inheritance. What about Peter? Well, when you look at 2 Peter, he also makes clear, as we mentioned earlier, that he's going to die. He knows that he's going to die. He tells them, 2 Peter 1, 13 down to 15, yes, I think it right as long as I'm in this tent, which is the New Testament metaphor for this body. I think it right as long as I'm in this body to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly... I must take off this tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Remember, Paul sent Timothy to Corinth to remind them of what Paul taught. Now we read Paul, I'm sorry, Peter saying, I will be careful, 2 Peter 1.15, to ensure that you always have a reminder of of these things after my departure, after I'm dead. 
What's it going to be? He said, I will be careful to ensure it. It's very important to him that you have a reminder of his teaching when he is dead. It's the third chapter. Beloved, I now write you this second letter, in both of which I stir up your minds by way of reminder. The letters. The letters are the reminder. He has ensured that we have the ability to call to mind his teaching by writing it down in these letters. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandments that we gave, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Yes, it's these letters that are reminding us. Paul, or I'm sorry, Peter. Also, you notice, does not give the name of somebody to succeed him, does not lay on hands of a presbytery or say that it's going to be entrusted to this council or that. No such thing. He said, I'm going to make absolutely sure that you can remember my teaching when I'm dead. Stirring you up by way of reminder as long as I'm in this tent. And then in the third chapter, I'm writing you a second letter. In both letters, I stir up your minds by way of reminder. This is what he intends for us to have after he's dead. And when you look at the Revelation, which is penned by the Apostle John, you know he started in chapter 1 and verse 9 is, is recorded there, but he started on the Isle of Patmos, I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that's called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Patmos is an island of exile in Rome. That's where they sent you to starve to death. That's telling us something. Because of the testimony of God, he was condemned to exile on Patmos, which means he's going to die of the elements, of hunger, of all the above. He knew that he was going to die as well. And he wrote this down, in which Jesus said very plainly in the closing of the book in the 22nd chapter, in the seventh verse, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of of this book. John also names no successor, leaves no family or children, if you will, gives no presbytery. No, 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 no. The message from John is the same as the message from Peter, is the same as the message from Paul and all the others. The blessing is for those who keep the words of this book. If you go with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, let's talk about bringing ourselves in simple trusting faith to God. The Bible is its own best witness and its own best testimony. Already in the days of the apostles, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he's afraid for them. In the fourth verse, he said, if one comes to you and preaches another Jesus whom we've not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you've not received or a different gospel which you've not accepted, well, you may well put up with that. You put up with that. A different gospel, a different Jesus. Jesus. Already in the times of the apostles, this is happening. People are saying things, pretending to be authorities when they are not, pretending to have been sent by the Lord when they were not, saying things that are perverse, drawing away disciples after themselves. That's already happening while the apostles are still alive. And he writes like this, I'm afraid for you because this is happening and you may well put up with it. But the 13th verse said, Such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. They're not real. They're fake. 
They look like apostles. They sound like apostles. They can quote them at length. But what they're saying is not true and it's not right. And we should not give heed to those things. Already in the days of the apostles, you had some who were very convincing and who were drawing away large numbers of people after themselves. But it was never right. It was never what the apostles had written. It was never what we were to go with. And Paul was worried about it for good reason, of course. No wonder, the 14th verse continues, Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. So it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Their end will be according to their works, though. Yes, it's going to be difficult sometimes to tease out the difference between the truth and error, between those who are actually serving God and those who are mixing the word with something else that is not actually godly at all. We have to know the scriptures well enough. We have to know the apostles well enough to be able to identify those things, to inoculate ourselves against the spread of that kind of error. The apostles left no confusion. Let's say it that way. There was not a question in their mind about what was going to happen when they died. They saw that it was coming. They knew that the time was here. They knew that they were writing Scripture. They knew that their word was authoritative over the word of any others, as we saw in all the various references that we looked at today. And when they were going to die, they did not name successors. They did not set up uh, any kind of architecture or organization that would take the place of the apostles speaking. Rather, they committed us to the thing that they had spent their lives writing, the New Testament, together with the Old, but you get the idea, the Scriptures. That was the perfect thing that would come and now remain only faith, hope, and love, these three. Though love is the greatest of them all. Do you love God? Do you love truth? Do you love what God wants for us? Do you love his son Jesus who gave his life for us that we might live? This is measured by your works, whether you obey him or not, whether you do what he says, whether you accept that Jesus is the son of God, he is the authority given by God, and that his words given to the apostles are also authoritative. And therefore we must give heed to the things that we have heard, lest at any time we drift away. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe he's resurrected from the dead? Do you understand that he's done this so that you can have life, so that you can put to death the old person of sins, confessing that God is right, that Jesus is the Son of God? Repent of sins. Change your heart to serve God from now on and be buried together with the Lord in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins where you'll be resurrected by God, a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus, created in him for good works, that we should walk in them. He prepared these things beforehand. We have water prepared that you might be baptized in the name of Christ and fulfill the commandments of the Lord through his apostles. Accepting the invitation of God to you to obey. But be, take courage, I would say, Christian friends. Take courage in the fact that God has made sure his word. God has done a short work on the earth and has made sure his testimony and his Bible. And it is the power of God to salvation. The gospel is the power of God to salvation for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Everybody who will come and study this word can come to know God and can be saved. So today, if you're a Christian and haven't lived right, repent. Let us pray with you that you might be restored to him because nobody's above temptation. Nobody's reached a sinless perfection in life. Nobody doesn't need the blood of Jesus. We all need forgiveness. Whatever you're struggling with is not something that we've never heard of or never been through. We, you'll find that there's people who know what that's like. And we'll be able to pray with you and pray on your behalf. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, please let the need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.